Hello, and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst. So Biden and Harris went on CNN last night. Jake Tapper, the host, asked, quote, who would you point to now as a leading progressive voice in your cabinet, end quote. And Kamala Harris could not give a single name. All she had was an excuse of, quote, we're not even halfway there, end quote. I don't even know how to take that. The economic team is chosen, but don't worry. If you want a progressive America, we will make it up to you with the uh, transportation secretary. Yeah, that's what you're going to get. Does she take us progressives for fools? Does she take any of us for fools? We helped get her elected. She claimed she was progressive. So I spoke yesterday about the economic team, about the corporate protection racket represented by Neera Tandon and Blackstone's own Brian Deese. But let's look for a moment at the foreign policy crew. Tony Blinken for the Secretary of State. Michelle Florney may become the Secretary of Defense. They were founders of a firm called West Exec Advisors. West Exec is a new breed of a firm. It isn't a think tank. It's not exactly a lobbying shop. They call themselves strategic advisors. Their slogan is, quote, West Exec Advisors brings the situation room to the boardroom. I can't even say it with a straight face. <laughs> West Exec, by the way, stands for West Executive Avenue, the closed street that runs inside the grounds of the White House, right past the Situation Room. West Exec even runs a map to helpfully <laughs> capture their proximity to power. So let's be clear. This is a 21st century version of selling your influence and contacts. Indeed, one of their offerings is their ability to bring, and I am quoting their website, quote, the full power of our network to bear in helping clients navigate rapidly emerging challenges and opportunities, end quote. So who exactly paid Tony Blinken and Michelle Florney for their sage advice and the power of their network, which I am sure includes their skill at turning doorknobs to open doors? We can't look at the list because technically they aren't lobbyists and they don't put their clients on their website. But they have said one of their roles is introducing tech companies to the Defense Department. So we know there's an Israeli AI company as one of their clients, a drone surveillance company as one of their clients, and Google Jigsaw, which if you don't know, is a unit within Google that explores threats to open societies and builds technology that inspires scalable solution. I don't really know what that means, but love to know what they're up to, privatizing domestic spying, who knows? Anyways, while Kamala Harris can't name a single progressive in the new Biden administration, this is all happening. They are stocking the place with folks like Blinken and Florney, who have been profiting off their relationships to big corporations, foreign and domestic, on both the economic and foreign policy side. By the time they get to naming a progressive or two, these corporatists would have already given away the entire store, aka our government. Lots of concern here. We are going to keep covering it. But in the meantime, we have an amazing show today. In honor of feminist power and leaning in, uh, you know, with Michelle Florney, the possible Biden defense secretary, it's Fem Friday. We're going to be talking to Nina Lakani at the top. And then later, Katie Halper will tell us why she's not a Russian operative. And of course, uh, we will have an all-star panel with Sia Weaver and our very own Piper Winkler. We're going to discuss housing policy and the massive eviction crisis we are in the midst of, but really about to face in the coming weeks. Stick around, we will be right back.
Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. I am so excited to have Nina Lakani on. She's an environmental justice reporter for The Guardian, and she's the author of Who Killed Berta Caceres? Uh, Dams, Death Squads, and an Indigenous Dis Defenders Battle for the Planet. You may recall uh, in 2016, in the heat of the Democratic primary, and I say that for a reason, uh, Berta Caceres was killed. She was a Honduran environmental activist and indigenous leader, and she's a co-founder and coordinator of the Council of Popular and Indigenous Organizations of Honduras, and she won uh, the Goldman Environmental Prize just the year before. Uh, this was a hot topic on the campaign trail, if you guys remember from 2016, um, and I'm just really uh, excited to have, have Nina on to talk a little bit more about her legacy and what happened. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. So, so I mean, let's just start, I guess, with the basics. Who, who was Bertha Caceres? So Bertha Caceres was an um, indigenous Lenka woman um, who, as you said, was a co-founder of the grassroots organization Copin, which is very much a organization um, fighting for the rights, you know, for, fighting for land rights, human rights, right to natural resources and self-determination. Um, so she was very much a grassroots leader but she was also, you know, a very sharp, smart political analyst, you know, um, and, you know, a great narrator. And she had this really unique ability to communicate, to understand local issues in a global context and explain them no matter who she was talking to. And all of those things, I think, made her really unique and really made her quite dangerous um, for, the, for the state. What was so dangerous about uh, what she stood for? And, and especially in 2016, I mean, we're not talking about the 50s here. Um, well, I think, you know, a good way to think about it is that, you know, every conflict in Latin America for the last 550 years have been about land and natural resources. Who has access to this, you know, to water, to land, to wealth, you know, natural wealth. And, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, you've had different people, different actors, governments, the crowd, you know, different, you know, royalty in Europe um, and companies, you know, all mixed together trying to take control over these natural resources. Right. And so um, her ability to, first of all, communicate with people to unite, um, you know, rural and urban people, teachers and farmers, you know, um, and her ability, you know, to, to really absorb and understand these very sort of global, big global issues, economic, military, geopolitical issues, and, you know, and see how they were sort of manifesting in her corner of the world or in other corners of the world, meant that actually, you know, she was, um, she, she just was really influential, you know, she could really sort of galvanize people, um, and, you know, and, and, she, and she didn't just do the grassroots protesting stuff, you know, she did legal cases, she challenged people um, in, in Congress, you know, she was just this really sort of, um, um, she had so many different skills, right, and I think because when you're talking about money, when you're talking about natural resources, you're always talking about money, her work opposing um, a dam in particular, but many other projects threaten the profits of investors, international and national investors, you know, and that in the end is always about the money. Was she getting close to a win? I mean, was the public pressure growing so much that they felt the need to, uh, I mean, we'll get to her, her death in a minute, but was, was the pressure growing tremendously? Yeah, yeah she, she was awarded the Goldman Prize because of her success in leading a campaign by Lenka communities to stop the construction of an internationally funded dam, a hydroelectric dam on a sacred river, which had been sanctioned after the coup um, in 2009, along with hundreds of other sort of environmentally destructive projects without any consultation. So that's why she was awarded the prize, right? In 2015, a few months later, it turned out that the company had actually been planning and plotting to keep constructing the dam. They had just moved the main site across the river. So in October of 2015, they start construction work again. And so therefore, her opposition, the protests, the roadblocks, etc., start up again. And so do, does the repression, you know, the threats, the intimidation, the deployment of security forces, um, the deployment of justice sort of um, law, um, law um, officers to repress 
her and the community. And what we know is that from that point on, she and other leaders were put under surveillance. They were paid informants um, um, that were used to, to spy on her, to track her every movement, and that the company relied on law enforcement, on, uh, on security forces, on judges, on prosecutors to enable this sort of repression to go on. Uh, what was the company trying using the dam for? What what, what were they looking to invest in? So so it was a, it, I mean it was to it was to um, generate electricity and energy right um, and so the in a, in communities where most people don't have light don't have electricity but that energy would not have been for that community right um, it would not have been that community it was mo it would most likely have been either gone to the national grid or to fund or to so power very energy hungry projects like mining right so you know and but what it would have meant for those for those communities is death right because without that river there is no life in these communities the river is what enables them to feed um to to, to you know to get food medicines um water for their um animals right at the end of when that community if that if that dam had been constructed it would have diverted the water from that um, river for electricity and you know it's so-called clean energy or green energy as we like to call it in the west but it would have ended up forcibly displacing many you know hundreds if not thousands of people in that in, in that region okay let's talk a little bit about the u.s's role in all of this um foreign policy at the time you know this was still under the obama administration uh, when Secretary Clinton was running for president, this became a topic that was brought up, at least in the activist campaign trail, quite a bit, a criticism of Secretary Clinton's policy. Of course, we understand uh, the instability of Central America and, and, and how that has affected our border policies uh, in the United States. So, so can we just talk a little bit about what, what, what the U.S.'s role yeah. in all of, of this was right at that time? I mean, the instability in Central America is because of US policies. Let's be clear about that, right? I mean, it's, these aren't happening just because on their own. The US has interfered and um, tried to control Central America for decades and decades, okay? Um, and, and for example, in Honduras, there was no armed forces in Honduras until, like, there was no sort of national armed forces in Honduras until 1954 um, when a US written piece of legislation in English gets passed to create the armed forces, which allows the US to use Honduras as a, a military base, a military satellite, which has continued to do so all the way through the Cold War, all the civil wars of Central America. That's where the US was based. That's where we trained Guatemalans to overthrow the democratically elected government that led to a civil war of 36 years. It trained the Contras there. It trained the worst military killers there in Honduras, right? So, and, 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 and in the last 15 years, it's been its base to fight its ill-fated war on drugs. So the US, its tentacles are all over Honduras in America and um, Central America. Based to fight the war on drugs. I mean, what, what I think is so, so fascinating about our, our, our policies uh, is there is now like an open consensus that these policies were failed policies. There have been countless documents that have been released and yet we're still there. Mm. Kind of, it's just shaped, reshaped a little bit. Uh, so, so how is Honduras key to fighting the war on drugs? Well, I guess, um, oh, you know, so there was, so in 2009 was a coup. Let's just start there, right? There was a coup and a democratically elected president, Manuel Zelaya, was shipped, was flown out on a helicopter to Costa Rica six months before the end of his term, right? This sort of was orchestrated by this network of elites in the country, military, political, economic, religious, right? Um, who were not willing to, I mean, what I, what I conclude in my book is that more than anything, what motivated that was the, the desire to sell off the country's natural resources, because that was what we have seen unfold ever since then. Now, I have not found any evidence that I can directly say the US participated in that, but they certainly enabled it to stick, right? They certainly, I, I think very quickly, while Obama called it a coup, Hillary Clinton very, very quickly was talking about new elections. You know, she was suddenly talking about Manuel Zelaya being ousted as a victory against Chavez, uh, Chavez, um, Chavism, you know, the line in with Hugo Chavez, which was just utter nonsense right and so and since then 
that has unleashed this utter nightmare in Honduras. You know, it became the most dangerous country in the world outside a war zone. 80% of cocaine destined for the US started transiting through Honduras. It's the most dangerous place in the world to be a land defender, to be a to be a um, lawyer, attorney, to practice journalism. It's up there. It has just and you know hundreds of thousands of Hondurans have fled that country towards the US since then. But like, that's what's happened over the same period. The US um, has done a, 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 it has done a lot of training of special forces, special uh, you know war on drug ops and special forces in Honduras. No country has had as many special forces training ops as Honduras has um, in the last 10 years or so. It sort of shifted from Colombia to Honduras, really, because transit routes were shifting, right? Because drug transit routes were shifting. At the same time, there is no let up in the amount of drugs from South America reaching US. So that's failure number one. What, secondly, we've seen all of these countries be utterly militarized and insecurity and violence just spiral out of control. That is why there are hundreds and thousands of Central Americans fleeing, you know, this sort of toxic mix of poverty, impunity, corruption, violence, you know, um, that, is, that they're not fleeing for it. Now, these aren't people making a decision one day to try their luck in the US. These are people that are fleeing structural and direct violence, you know, which you cannot say that the US has not and does not play a role in because it does. And oftentimes, you know, it's, 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 they're scared. They've had th threats on their lives and their communities. And then they have to navigate through Mexico to the border with these coyotes that are just as dangerous. And then, of course, you know, we know what ends yeah. up happening with our borders. Um, you've experienced uh, a lot of threats too and surveillance and, and pushback in investigating this book. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then we can talk about her actual. Um, how she died, of course. Yeah, sure. And so, you know, I mean, I I interviewed, I met Betha when she was alive, you know, in, back in 2013, I'd met, um, I interviewed her then. Um, and then when she, so when she got killed, I, you know, was sent there from the Guardian. Um, I was a freelancer at the time based in Mexico, but, um, and started really investigating her death. And that's what, how, you know, I ended up writing the book. Um, but when, when I started publishing stories that really started to expose um, that the sort of, you know, exposed that the official um, narrative was only a tiny part of the story. So, for example, I published a story quite quickly, um, within a few months, right, that her name had actually appeared on a military hit list a few weeks before her death. And, oh, and a, mili a military hit list? Yeah, a military hit list, which she had told me about herself in 2016, but when, but, um, no, sorry, in 2013. But when she got killed... My story was based on an army deserter whose squad was given the hit list. And it was a list of, you know, campesino leaders, social leaders, community leaders, pol political oppositions who the military were saying needed to be silenced, right? That, you know, basically they were to target them. So I write that story. And this, this young deserter, um, army deserter, he worked for like one of the top, you know, units, like special forces which the US invests in, right? Which the US trained, which the US invests in. So I write that story and that's when it all sort of starts, you know, that sort of the minister, of, the, you know, the defence minister, the head of the armed forces come out and give press conferences basically saying, you know, I am trying to ruin the good name of Honduras. You know, we have complaints. I get all these bot campaigns starting out. I get called a media terrorist and my pictures sort of put out everywhere. And the US ambassador to Honduras at the time, you know, is... Um, you know, starts up a pretty underhand, off the record campaign to try and discredit me and my reporting. Like, you know, wait, all wait, of the extra how, how did they, it obviously wasn't above board, above board, but how was the ambassador doing so? He was going, he was, he was going around giving, um, holding sort of like meetings with different people, you know, basically saying, oh, she doesn't understand how, you know, the army works. Oh, she's got this wrong. You know, I mean, just really trying to undermine, saying that there was no evidence of this. And then when I spoke to him myself, because I had put all these questions to the Honduran army and to the US Department of State, right? They chose not to respond to any of the allegations and then launch these campaigns against me. And when I finally spoke to him a few months later, he said to me, um, if you don't hand over the death list to us, 
that you claim exists and anyone else dies on it, there'll be blood on your hands. That like, you know, like it was my responsibility. And as I pointed out to him, I say, Bertha Casares denounced the existence of this death list, this hit list in 2013. What did you do to, 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 to investigate then, right? He claimed to, that his, his team had investigated my claims and found no evidence of a hit list, yet didn't speak to any single person who I had interviewed didn't speak to the head of the, um, the special forces who ran this, you know, run, who we know has been involved in setting up death squads in parts of Honduras. You know, it was a complete sham. But that's when it all started, you know. And after that, I had to take, you know, I never went back to Honduras in by plane. I would go like these really you know, 24 hour journeys sort of overland. Um, and I took, you know, lots of measures. I didn't publish stories while I was in the country until the trial until the murder trial right when I was there I was the only journalist covering the trial every day and yeah I got the, these false fake press releases were put out signed by well not fake the press releases are real but they were signed by these fake you know in groups farmers groups claiming that I was inciting hate, um, violence in a certain part of the country that I was not a journalist that I should be declared persona non grata from Honduras um, that I was a, um, what else did I say? They linked me to organised crime. They then called me a terrorist. All the classic dirty tactics, right, that we've, you know, that we've seen being used. But it really, you know, it placed a huge amount of pressure on me, you know, like there was a lot of people telling me to come back, not to stay. But that, that was the intention, right? It was like, okay, the one journalist that won't shut up about this case, let's get her out. And I just couldn't leave, you know, so it was, yeah, I mean, I remember speaking to a security consultant saying to me, Look, my advice to you is to stay inside and order takeout. And I'm like, well, I can't do that for six weeks. Do you know what I mean? I'm just, you know. Um, yeah. Pre-COVID, now you can. Now you no, can definitely yeah, that's You're my life home. now. That's just my life now, right? And so it's all of my life. But yeah, I mean, it was, re you know, really t tense and, you know, just like really difficult, you know. And then since I published a book, a lot of this started again, you know, I've had like bot campaigns and like lots of sort of you know, nasty things being written about me and the richest man in Honduras sort of making all sorts of threats because he doesn't like what I've said in the book and, you know, um, about um, his bank um, and so forth. So, you know, threats come in many different forms, right? It, it, yeah, they're not just um, so it's you know that you're actually up, you're you're getting somewhere in terms of the truth you know when you upset lots of people but it's certainly not been easy let's talk about what happened to bertha um and the events that led up to it, because, you know, just as you described this, I, I, I just finished the Jakarta method, uh, which right. is- I haven't read it yet. I really want yeah. to. And I'm thinking, okay, when I'm reading, I'm thinking, how did this happen in the sixties under the Johnson administration? How did this happen? And what you're telling me right now, and granted it wasn't a million people, uh, as far as we know, death squads in, in, in 2016, um, oh, barely yeah. being covered in the press. And, and it, 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 there's just, the tactics seem to have stayed, have remained. Yeah, so oh god me... yeah yeah i mean honestly i i mean i um i say this in my book that you know the killing of bertha Cáceres was like the grand finale of a whole campaign of terror which had all the hallmarks of you know a classic con counterinsurgent strategy you know bribes by threats sexual harassment imprisonment you know all of these different things to try and neutralize her because they considered her an enemy and when none of those things work when they couldn't jail her when they couldn't silence her when they couldn't force her to leave the country that's when they decided to kill her it's classic counterinsurgency right um and so um she as i said when when the project was restarted um all of these sort of those repressive you know measures started to be you know rolled out again and I have to say, you know, so, you know, and when, yeah, I mean, she was killed in March 2016, hired hitman, entered her home and shot her and she was shot dead in her pyjamas, in her bedroom. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think that was very much purposeful, that message. You know, I think the thing is, the people who were prof profiting from this business and not just, you know, she was a bad example, right? She wasn't just, she was a woman. An idea that a woman and an indigenous woman could be interrupting 
their plan, right, was a bad example that they were not willing to tolerate, you know. And so, and I think to kill somebody in their home late at night when you're in your, you know, you're most vulnerable, you know, like you're in your, you're in your jammies, right? And like some, and, you know, they, they could have killed her anywhere, right? But they entered her home to do that. And she was shot dead, um, so, you know, trying to defend herself, you know, um, but shot down. Um, her friend, a Mexican um, environmentalist called Gustavo Castro, was in the house. That is the one thing that they didn't know. And he was shot also, and he survived by plain dead, basically. You know, he put his hand up just as the bullet came, but it hit his ear. So there was a lot of blood, and he just lay really still, and the gunman was convinced that he was dead. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we, you know, the, what the state did, w there was complicity before and after with the company and, pe you know, state, pe members of the state. For example... The police, you know, authorities straight away started saying it was a robbery, right? Classic, you know, then that it was because of internal conflicts in Copin. Then they tried to accuse or they tried to paint Gustavo Castro, the Mexican, as a suspect. They refused to let him leave the country. Um, and, so, and while this was happening, we know now from the phone data that was uncovered during a murder investigation, that there was all this going to back and forth between senior people in the company and law enforcement. You know, that one. How were you able to get this, this documentation, the phone information? So this was the, uh, un uncovered during the murder inquiry, right? So I, you know, I was given access to a lot of the files. Um, I mean, Honduras, like the rest of Latin America, their justice systems are based on the Spanish justice system, right? Where you have a state prosecution but also people who are designated by the court as victims to a crime can run parallel prosecutions, completely, you know, independent parallel prosecutions alongside the state. So her family were, had, should have had, or, you know, I meant to have all the same access to all of the sort of evidence during discovery, basically. There's a sort of meant to be a sharing of that. Um, and so I was sort of getting access to that and so, and analyzing, you know, thousands of pages of phone documents. But you saw these messages, you know, between senior people in the in the in the dam company, you know, saying, "Look, don't worry. The minister, so and so, the minister of security has told told us it's going to be fine. It's going to be a crime of passion." You know, like there was all of this um, complicity going on. But all, you know, and um, yeah, and none of that none of that has been none of those lines of investigation have ever been investigated, right? You know, what what happened in the end was um, um, there was such a huge international outcry, you know, here in the US, but. In many parts of the world, I mean, she was probably the most famous or well-known, like, activist in Latin America at the time because she'd won the Goldman Prize. You know, she'd been she'd been to Rome, had had an audience with the Pope not long before. You know, and so um, all these things that her children thought protected her didn't. Right? I mean, they killed her anyway. That's how confident I think their Honduran state and these company executives were that in their in their in 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 the impunity that exists in that country. Nina, I am so fascinated uh, by the work that you've done. And, and I think, you know, as we sit here, I mean, I, it's, 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 we're entering this new administration. W one thing I just have to remind everybody is this all happened in the Obama years. Yeah. As I start off the show talking about national security um, and the folks who are going to be leading our defense department potentially and our, our uh, secretary of state, the, the state department, uh, we have to keep these things in mind that, that, these policies came out of the previous administration that led to the instability and, um, you know, the, the tactics, while they may not be coming directly from the U.S., they're coming from multinational organizations and companies and banks and, banks and yeah. in conjunction with uh, governments that, you know, still to this day should be operating. Um, no one's... Yeah. Like, I mean, I was just going to say that I think, you know, in the environmental justice world, we talk very much about um, sacrifice communities, you know, people of color, low income communities, Native American um, territories. I really believe that for a long time, dating back many sort of administrations, Central America has been considered a sacrifice zone, right? It's where many of the, of the US's worst policies, foreign policies have been tried and tested, right? You know, and, and I think, now we're seeing that with climate crisis, right? You know, Central America is pretty much a big island surrounded by oceans and seas. The impact of the climate crisis is happening. We've had 
you know, a, a lot of the forced migration from Guatemala last year was being driven by drought. People were starving to death, right? We've seen two deadly hurricanes hit Honduras in the last, within two, two months, weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in two weeks they were there, a million and a half um, Hondurans have lost their crops, their homes, you know, the climate crisis here. And you just think this has been a region that has been considered just, you know, as a plaything, as a sacrifice zone. And so like you're saying, we didn't start with Trump. Did it get worse? Absolutely. Right. Um, but it didn't start with Trump. And I don't think we can let we can't say it's going to end with Joe Biden becoming president. We can't be sure, you know, that things are going to suddenly be great because I think there's a lot exactly. of work to be done. You know, Lakani, check out her book. Uh, if we can put that up on screen, it's a screen. It's called Who Killed Berta Casares? It was published in June of this year. Uh, she's also a reporter at The Guardian. Definitely check out her book if you have a chance. We'll put the link in our uh, in the description. Hope to have you on again soon. Please be safe, be well, and you know, thank you for your courage because this is thank this you. Is, it's a, it takes a lot of courage. Yes. Thank you very much. See you. All right, take care, Nina. Bye. All right, after this very quick break. We're going to be back with Katie Halper. Is she a Russian operative or not? That's what we need to know. We're going to get to the bottom of it with a rapid fire round of questions. Be right back. Thanks for watching and listening to the Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the nomikeyshow.com to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. We have the host of the Katie, Katie Halper Show and co-host of Useful Idiots, Rolling Stone's Useful Idiots, with Matt Taibbi, uh, the one and only Katie Halper. Katie, thanks for joining us. I need to get to the bottom of this. We uh, Last week, we had on Josh Fox, our friend, uh, and, and we were talking about a lot of stuff, <laughs> as you saw and you covered in, on your show um, just a couple days ago. And he mentioned that uh, there is a cabal of leftist hosts that may or may not be, whether they're conscious of it or not, or are directly influenced by Russia, um, meaning Putin. Let me be very clear, because he was adamant about me saying Putin, not Russia, Putin, uh, are, are influenced by Putin. So I got so much pushback from this interview. Um, now, keep in mind, you know, you know this, Katie. I'm very good friends with Josh Fox. I've had a lot of, you know, we we will talk for hours at a time. And I think it was a very casual conversation online. And so folks said, you know, I didn't push back. I kind of just let him roll because sometimes that's the best way just to kind of get a sense of who some, you know, what someone's perspective is. I was like, I don't think Katie Halper is a Russian operative, <laughs> but uh, let's talk a little bit about this because you did touch on on the show and, and um, I would love to hear why you're so concerned with this perspective, but I'm, I'm going to, you know, give his perspective too, because I think it's important to understand the nuance. I felt like he needed to be a little bit more nuanced. I also think that, that if you're, if you're going to say I'm not echoing Putin's talking points, then that also, you have to explain why. Okay. No, Katie. So, so there's, so Russian media, RT is funded by Russian hold government. On, there's on. no debate over that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Okay. Yes, I'm. I'm looking at talking points right now as we speak. Um, uh, Vlad, very happy that you don't believe I'm Russian infiltrator. Um. Oh, but he did not want me to say on TV that I was. Okay. Sorry. So, what's the question? 
I understand. I get it, Katie. But, you know, there is, we've been on RT before, you know, there's, there's no, it's, it's paid for by the Russian government. So like, like that, other, as you know, other channels are paid for by corporations. Yes, yes, yes. yes. We're, we're not, we're CBS smart on our channel. Uh, we can CBC understand or, anyone. Uh, yes. What is it? Yeah. Okay. But, but we're having a conversation about Russia. We're not having a conversation about the corporate media, which we do yeah. 85% sure, yeah. of our show is about okay, the yeah. corporate so media. What, so what's the so, point about the Russia? So, so his RT point, being, having, his, being his, part by Russia, his part point by Russia. is yeah. when he hears leftist hosts mimicking the same arguments almost instantaneously. This is what he said on the show. Yeah, the, I, no, the I talking points of RT, right? Yeah. The talking points of RT. So, he asks why, and I and I have to say, out of all the conversations we could be having right now, I feel like RussiaGate is not the one we should be talking no, but about. This is an important thing. I mean, you asked the the, the idea. There are a couple of really dangerous uh, premises. One is the idea that if your talking points, and first of all, I don't have a talking point. What I did, and I defend, mm -hmm. and I think it's actually uh, pretty disgusting, if we're being honest, to not just call for a film to be censored, but to call for a film to be censored and then say you didn't call for the film to be censored, which to be clear, I know Josh. Okay, so the definition of censorship is, is the government censoring. So I just want to put that out there because we well, use the term censoring very loosely. Okay, uh, yes. And he, he said that it was not consider, Wait, I have a question though. Do you yeah. consider, um, uh, do you consider like Pan America to be a good source of defining censorship? Generally speaking, but you know they've also made uh, false decisions. Right, but they're but they're like they're an well. organization that exists, right? They are literally for or f are, free speech for tracker. Let's talk about free, free, speech. free speech tracker. Sure. Okay. Free so I just want to quote Penn. Penn, of course, is what Penn, uh, poets and essayists and novelists, and they're a major free speech organization. And they uh, described it thusly: calls to pull a film because of disagreement with its content are calls for censorship, plain and simple. Those who take issue with the film have every right to make their concerns and arguments heard. But first and foremost, the public also has the essential right to view Moore's film and make their own judgments. And okay, fine. The point is this: if Josh and you want to define censorship as only no, no, uh, no, no, when no. the government, he's okay. not defining it. I am defining it on the show right, as the okay. classic Shh. definition, the journalistic right. I mean, definition, art, and like, like the, like the, like. In journalism school. I mean, you there know, are it's, so it's, many people who use censorship. Okay, let's say I'll concede that point. I disagree with that because as we know, Pan America, which is one of the biggest anti-censorship pro Yes, but they've had problematic takes before, so we have to make that No one has ever given it. Has anyone ever pushed back on Pan for not having yes. a good definition of censorship? Yes. Where? Tell me. Well, Where's the example? All right, let's, I'll get you an example no. in a second. I will look at it. All right, give me an example. On. Well, so let me finish. Like, I want to start on, my first point. Katie, I didn't think I didn't bring you on to talk about censorship. Though. I brought you on to talk about Russiagate because I don't understand Oh, wait, but they're, why. okay, they're related. Hold on, please. Okay. These are totally related. And they're related because there's censorship and then there's effective censorship or suggested censorship in the form of smearing. And here's what's very dangerous about the first thing you said, that my talking points line up with RT's talking points. Do you realize you know he this because you were a Bernie Bernie that. person. He said that. And this is something infuriating that people say. People would say, Bernie Sanders, he's against the TPP. So is Donald Trump. It's an absurd argument. You yourself no, no, defended no, no. Ro Khanna the other day because he yeah. went on Fox and made an anti-war argument that isolationists make without being anti-war. Okay. So that is a very ridiculous thing. There's literally I okay. There's no, he, no he evidence said, hang whatsoever. On a second, Katie, that, Katie. You're, that you're saying something that other people say, that's no, suspicious? No, 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 that's a very, he said, like, I just, I, because he's, you didn't want to debate him, okay? I wanted you guys to debate. So what I'm going to do is well, I'm going to- I didn't want to debate him because he, he lied. He accused me of being a Russian but infiltrator. And know me, you should have asked him as a journalist, you should have asked him why he said there I did was no that. attempt to, no, did you ask him why there was no attempt to take, he said there was no attempt to take down the film, which he did say? He did answer that at the end. I didn't what have did to. Say? Wait, you're, you okay, Katie, hang on a second. You're, you're all over say? the place. Katie, not, you're all- No, me. Yeah, Katie, you're, I'm trying you're, to talk about I was thing. being nice because I thought that you felt like, okay, fine, go. I, I didn't I know that get we into the, be... No, I'm not, there's no- Okay, but, what's but, the Russian gate question you have? Kate, Katie, I'm trying to get into the nuance here. And both Josh and you re refuse to get into the nuance here and you start talking about censorship of this. Wait, wait, I, wait. I was, no, me, I'm sorry. This is not a, an accurate representation of what happened. If you want to say, that you would like me to be more nuanced. And sure, tell me what you want to talk about. So, Fine. Wait, but question. excuse me. I did not, no, 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 this is not, this is a false equivalence. I did not appear false anywhere I'm and asking call Josh. You say both you and Josh, as if we're both, oh, these guys are crazy. There's just a clear difference. 
he went on your show and I wasn't mad at you because I was sympathetic because I've had people on my show who I'm friends with and it's awkward to push back on. But this whole like, oh, you guys, can't you work it out? Why can't you debate each other? That's not what I'm saying at all. One of them, all right, well, he, okay. So what's your Russia game? I think you should debate. You did a a 25 minute segment afterwards. And I was like, it would have been way more interesting if you debated him rather than his clip. I don't know. I just found it. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, so you're upset that I made a comedic video of this, which you should link to. No, no, didn't say that. that. Katie, Katie, hang on. Just let me ask a question, okay? Hang on. Yeah. I know this is tense. I know that that, that you're you've you've been accused of this law. So what I'm trying to get into is the weeds about how this is not okay. Sure. Oh, I'm, what what okay. are the weeds? Yeah. So if you ask me, if you let me ask the question. Yeah. What I'm trying to get to here is so his concern is that when RT says something, and this is not the same as Bernie, and I was a surrogate, I'm very familiar I with know. this. No, I was making an, an analogy. So, so what his concern that. is when RT puts out a segment. And then uh, Max Blumenthal pushes something out on the same exact language, exact language. That was his concern. I'm, I'm, this is, these are Josh's words, okay? Because we couldn't right, have a debate with you're, Josh. Yeah, but you, could, you should either, if you're asking me about that, you Katie. should have the exact words Katie, or ask Katie. Josh what they are. Katie, no me, Katie. No me, no me. I'm trying to ask a question, okay? No, so, but you just said you were quoting All right, wrap, Josh up, the, saying, wrap up the interview. If the, I can't do that ask a question, Katie. I'm wrapping up the interview. This is ridiculous. I'm trying to actually get in the, de- there's a real debate on the left about this. And I want the, de- I want the left to debate. Yeah, but if it. you're saying Other that Josh, Josh, if you're Katie, saying that Katie, Josh Katie, Fox Katie, made Katie. points and you're not presenting those points, the exact same language, what was the Katie, exact same I can't language even get the question out. Lewis, you're not letting me get the question out. I just tried to, I asked you a simple question. What's the language? Katie, are you the host that- or my host? I am trying to get into the news. No, I'm me. trying to help you. Your okay. argument was not clear. So I'm trying to help you get to that argument okay so i'm asking you because your left. argument wait this is very simple can you tell me what josh said the exact same language was this is very simple katie i have a question i'm trying to ask you and you're not letting me ask it okay i am trying to help you because there are people on the left right now who are literally like why is katie helper aligning with jimmy Dore and rt when i know that's not who you are and so what i'm trying to specifically say i, I have 12 questions here is I this even live, by the way of course it is Oh, okay. It was a live show. So you should cut the segment. All right. Um, well, because I have another interview in two minutes. All right. So I we're an hour long I, show a day. All right. I think that the question though is, I yeah, want to know what the same language is. That's not. That's not Katie, an absurd thing. I to didn't ask. even let me ask the question before you push back. His I'm assumption. Back. Right. His assumption. His assumption. You watch the interview. His assumption is. And this is a live show, right? His assumption is that your talking points mimic Jimmy Dore's and this, and they all come out at the same time. And my question is, and this is just my first question because I have 20 more questions, 12 questions I want to ask you. My, my question is, okay, fine. What I'm very curious about is, all right, if you're not aligned with all of these people and that's fine, why, Katie, you're, you're a good host when we're in the midst of five days before the election, right? Suddenly, every the, the, the talking points are coming back about um, about oil and gas, and this is absolutely true because I did look it up. Um, the oil and gas industry, right, started uh, pushing out talking points against the Biden, uh, the oil and gas industry against against Putin, and 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 um, the Russia gate started popping up five days before. See, I'm already off topic now. Five days before the election, the certain conversation topics were popping up five days before the election. And my question is, why was Russiagate? Why was this popping up right before the election? And why was um, Josh getting, why was the film conversation? Why was the article from Max Blumenthal popped up right before the election when it came out? So segments on Josh Fox and the movie and Michael Moore popped up five days before the election when it came out months before. And so like when the whole world was talking about the actual election, suddenly this was the most important thing for leftist hosts to bring up. And I'm not saying that was your intention, but like- oh, it's not my intention. I wasn't played by the Russians. You're all played. Like you were played by Josh Fox. You don't even have the by, alleged don't talking points. You're, I cannot believe this narrative that you're accepting that it's the onus is on I'm me not. to prove that I, you know what, here's the irony. We had Michael Moore on the show, you know why? We'd had him on before on Useful Idiots, yeah. but we really want to have him on because we thought it was so ridiculous that Josh Fox attempted to, according to Penn, good source on this stuff, censor the film. So that's one issue. But I, I didn't really think, I didn't think we would, I honestly thought you would be like laughing Katie, at the Russia gay claim. I am I, trying I, to. I don't even understand. Katie, hey, hey, I was trying 
to be helpful to you. And what I was at my initial pr presentation, you're rolling your eyes at me, Katie, but you've been on Fox News before and you've treated Fox News hosts nicer than you have me. Well, that's not true. I've like, I've talked down to them about lots of stuff. I'm not talking Katie, down to you. I'm friends with you. So I expected Katie, this to go differently. It was supposed to, but you wouldn't let me ask the first question. And my first question oh, was literally okay. just quoting Josh. My question, this is Josh's theory, not my theory, Josh's theory. And because you didn't want to debate him. And by the way, he told me, try to get on Useful Idiots to give his perspective and you declined it. Oh, so well, I'm, you, he didn't ask me, so I and I've known him for idea. years. Well, I yeah. don't know why he didn't ask me. That's weird. Well, you I can ask. I, will you no. have Max Blumenthal on, by the way? I'd be happy to have Max okay, Blumenthal. You, on. That's what you should do. But I have I mean, no problem with this. But my this whole perspective is, is, if I'm listen, I wanted to get into this, and, I'm, and Josh wanted to debate you, and it would have been so much easier if I just let you guys ask you guys specific well, questions. It would have had to. Have but I can't many, ask you, and so I'm trying to get to the through the weeds, and it's it's just it's just not happening on this segment because just ask because me the question then. I, well, I have question. to wrap up the segment because I have two panelists waiting right now. Okay, so you couldn't quote Josh Fox, you couldn't actually prove the premise of your question. I, Sorry, I didn't think this would be combative either. Well, Katie, Sorry. you cut me off in my first question. You started no, going I've given you, about I censorship. asked you very clearly. I said, "What oh, is guys, Josh I gotta Fox's go. I gotta go. talking?" I gotta wrap it up. Saying I'm repeating. You watched and you're the segment. Yeah. He's talking points. And I just right. said five Tell me the thing that you popped up to, the Max Blumenthal article from five. Literally said infiltration. Literally, that was his proof. He said they're infiltrators. Again, so you know I, what? Black Lives Matters. Was that also? Was listen, that also something? Wait, Katie, I'm no, not no, fighting no, with him. I don't Black agree with him. I don't Black? agree. Oh my God, that, Katie. Black Lives I, Matter. What? Would you repeat that argument? That's what's guys. I gotta right? go. I gotta go. We have we have guests in the waiting room. We have guests in the waiting room. I see. This is live. All righty. All right, guys, you know, no, bring me back on. I want to go back on. No, Katie, bring Katie out. I got to set up the next interview. We don't have enough time. You know, I, I tried very hard, and I know this is a really tense topic, but I offered the interview. I offered a debate between Josh and Katie. All I wanted to do was present 12 of the points that Josh made. She wanted me to quote him verbatim. I don't have those clips ready because it was a 25-minute interview. And the frustration is I wasn't able to get my first question out. And, you know, it went hostile because I couldn't answer. I couldn't even ask the question I wanted to ask. I understand this is a tense to topic. I actually don't agree with either one of them. I think it's not fair right now to be mimicking the points, especially right before an election, that I I'm sorry, just mimicking anybody's points is when we were right before an election, there were priorities of issues. Like we're very conscious about the segments we put on our show. We're very conscious about the topics we bring up. As you saw, it was foreign policies at the top. Then we talked about Berta Casares. You know, now we're going to talk about evictions. These are issues that have, to me, mean a lot. And especially as we're talking about a future administration. And so I know a lot of you guys are very smart in the audience and you have watched a lot of shows and you may have wondered, okay, well, why are some sh shows presenting this? Maybe it has to do with algorithms. Maybe it has to do with clickbait. Maybe it has to do with whoever, maybe they're in bed with Republicans. Maybe they're in bed with Putin. I don't know. I don't care. But what I wanted to get to the heart of because Katie's response to Josh's clip on our show was comical. And I didn't feel like I had an answer for, she just you know, threw it aside like she's not a Russian operative. Obviously she's not a Russian operative. No one thinks that. I don't think that. I, I, I honestly don't. But I also am very curious why she was, she didn't have an actual rebuttal to specific questions about oil and gas, which was fascinating um, on the show, but I didn't get to those questions. So maybe we can have them both on later. Um, I, you know, this isn't a joke. This is, the movement is larger than it's ever been. The Bernie Sanders movement, I want, this is a moment I actually want to talk to you guys because this is really important. The movement is larger than it's ever been in US history. We have two generations. The millennial generation is the largest generation in history. It is the most progressive. It is the most anti-establishment. It is the biggest threat to corporate power, arguably since the progressive era. Bernie Sanders represented that threat. Bernie Sanders, that's why we have these nuanced conversations. What happens if Bernie Sanders goes to an administration and is no longer in the Senate and no longer has a campaign fund that helps other candidates win? That's why we have conversations about the algorithm. When the algorithm switches and suddenly leftists can't get their voices out. That's why we have conversations about the revolving door in the Biden administration. What happens when people from Google, what happens when people from Facebook go into the administration? That's why we have these conversations about Central American policy and what's happening in Turkey right now and Armenia. Because what's happening is the geopolitical stage is shifting. Simultaneously, the movement on the left is undeniably, tr they're trying to repress it. 
And so when I see fellow leftist hosts consumed by these debates, it hurts the movement. And I think it's important to get into the nuance because you know, I, I saw it in the chat, like people were mad I didn't push back against Josh Fox and I didn't, I just let him roll because I think he sort of made the case for himself and I didn't agree with it. And I don't think people did, but I wasn't able to ask those questions and I wasn't able to have the two of them on to debate. So I had to present his perspective so she could respond, but I couldn't get the question out. And that's not helpful. And I love Katie and she's my friend and we'll talk about this afterwards, but we have to be very thoughtful about the fights that we're picking right now. And I don't think anything in that segment was productive right now. If anything, it just continues to divide the left. And that's the last thing that happens right now. I would rather have a very real conversation about why Josh thinks she's a Russian operator or whatever he thinks. And I would like to have a conversation about why Katie is a consumed with Russiagate when we're not talking about other issues that are more important because we need collective power. We need collective power. And if we don't have collective power and for fighting, and if we're appealing to analytics and clicks and, and, and narratives that are really just like not the priority right now, then I don't know what we're doing here. All right, um, let's go to a quick break and let's just let the panelists know we're going a little bit over. Thanks Dorsey for all your patience. One of the issues that is uh, of primary concern to working Americans across the country right now, especially in cities across the country where rents have been extraordinary high at record levels and the cost of living, um, and there are very few rent protections, is of course the mass eviction crisis. People are being evicted across this country right now. Any uh, states or cities that have had any sort of moratoriums on evictions, many are about to, to expire in as soon as two or three weeks. Um, Piper Winkler is, uh, she is not only a member of our team at TNS, uh, she is an associate producer here, but she is the Harvard YDSA co-chair. Uh, and she was uh, most recently uh, a working over at Jacobin, our friends over at Jacobin, and she's a housing advocate. Piper, thanks for joining us. Can you unmute yourself? You're on mute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna take, just wanna like brush off the heat for a second. <laughs> the joy of live TV. You just learned it right there. <laughs> All right, Piper. Um, this housing crisis that we're facing is, I feel like it's just not being discussed in the media. It's frankly not being discussed enough in left media either. And we, it's not just that people are about to be evicted. Folks should be about to be evicted with potentially tens of thousands of dollars in 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 um, back pay that they have to pay for rent and without jobs or not the incomes to support it because of this this COVID crisis. Um, can you just like give us a little bit of a breakdown of, of what's happening and if there are any sort of measures on the table right now, um, even if it's locally, to protect uh, to pr protect tenants? Yeah, absolutely. So the liberal sense of what needs to be done 
You know, the liberal sense of what needs to be done um, for housing during COVID is that this is a unique sense of emergency. You know, according to this position, housing hasn't housing insecurity hasn't really been a problem before. All we need to do is get through this unique break, uh, the, these unprecedented times, and then we can get back to commodified housing uh, as usual. So, for example, we've seen a proposal from the left, from people like in my great state of Massachusetts, Mike Connolly. We've seen people propose, you know options like freezing rent and you know more permanent pushes to make sure that people have secure housing uh things like you know an eviction moratorium that lasts for the duration of this crisis but of course once people get out of that left-wing people understand that the back paid months of rent aren't going to go away and that housing is going to continue to be a problem of course, uh, what's happening with a lot of liberal and, and conservative governors, for example, or other lawmakers is not acknowledging that this problem is going to continue and that people's housing security isn't going to go away. And of course, um, people aren't linking this to a health crisis that is undoubtedly already occurring because of the fact that so many people are facing housing insecurity. So for example, there have been 433,000 cases of COVID that we know of that are linked to people being evicted. And sadly, there have also been 10,700 deaths. All of this is totally preventable. If only lawmakers have done what people are doing all over the world and saying, we need to freeze the rent, we need to cancel right. the rent, not just, you know, pause evictions. We need to fully make sure that nobody ever feels, you know, the, the pain and suffering and economic devastation that is going to be caused during this time. But it's not happening. When you say caused by... Uh, evictions how what does that mean they're out on the streets and they're 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 or they're in uh they're in whatever sort of housing um whether it's affordable housing or uh public housing i mean i i don't know what what is what let's get into the specifics there like how is this affecting folks when they're evicted yeah absolutely so for example there are a lot of people who are living in market rate housing meaning that it's not necessarily protected by you know affordable measures or anything like that People are, you know, are being kicked out of their housing and going onto the streets in a lot of cases. My own background is actually in homeless services, so I know how overburdened those systems already are and how unfit they already are to serve people's needs as, you know, individuals who deserve private and dignified lives. So the fact that also because of the pandemic, shelters have been closing, they're working at reduced capacity, people are going to face a very real crisis of having nowhere to go but onto the street, not having any safe place to sleep. And of course, I'm from Massachusetts where the winters are extremely cold and this is a matter of life or death for, for so many people. And you know, the very, the very light and insufficient um, you know, eviction moratorium that, that has been brought on by the Trump administration is already going to expire soon and it wasn't enough to begin with. Of course not. Um, is have you seen anything coming from the the Biden administration um, addressing the eviction crisis, or specifically? I mean, we know that um, folks have not seen any money in eight nine months, whatever it's been at this point, and even then it was so little. And the minimal that people, you know, even progressives are asking for is two thousand dollars a month. Of course, that doesn't even go far enough if you live in a major city. Uh, if you have more than a one bedroom apartment in a major city in America, uh, you know, if you have a family, if you're just two parent, I mean, it's 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 definitely not enough, especially given the back pay. So, have you heard anything coming out of the Biden administration that is sounding the alarm on this crisis? Yeah, it's clear that the administration is not acknowledging what a very real problem this is. And I'm seeing a lot of messaging from Biden on, on social media, for example, saying, you know, we need to come together and get through this, like making appeals that both sides need to get over, you know, bipartisan animosity, et cetera. But it's not going to happen. Like none of this is going to have any meaning whatsoever, actually, whether or not there's any kind of bipartisan support, unless it is materially providing the material that people need to get through this crisis to survive, you know? So it's not going to suffice for Biden to tweet about how it would be great if Americans all, you know, hunkered down during this time. If people don't have a place to live, they can't hunker down. It's not possible. Yeah, they have nowhere to live. Um, public housing is is already in crisis too in terms, even if you are in some form of affordable housing, uh, say in New York, uh, there are evictions happening in public housing because it's already expensive in New York. I mean, people, I don't think people have a sense. I remember when I was running for public advocate and we were having housing debates. Um, I couldn't believe how many New York City lawmakers had no sense of the cost of living in, in the largest housing provider in New York City, the largest city in the country. Um, and just the crises that they're, they're already existing in public housing and then to see mass evictions from public housing. So you have 
you know, the, the conversation, um, the federal government is doing absolutely nothing. When you look at what they could do just with public housing because of the federal uh, money that's being put in there, it's, I, I think we're about to face a really uh, difficult time. And of course, public housing in New York, at least, is the majority of those households are led by women. So that leads to my, my next question. Um, oftentimes folks don't understand the intersection between uh, domestic abuse cases and, and how that affects you know, women who have suffered domestic abuse, um, sometimes won't get help, sometimes uh, won't leave their partners because of the fear of losing housing, um, because of two, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's two funded households, whatever, whatever the situation is, um, you know, not having a place to go and live. And of course, right during the pandemic, that just makes it much worse. So you're, you've, um, I know you've highlighted some recent stories about this. Can you kind of catch us up on how COVID has affected women uh, across this country? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first, I wouldn't dare to call myself a feminist if I didn't support a homes guarantee and decommodifying housing overall. I mean, it's clear that, you know, in across the country, as people are increasingly facing housing instability, choices that have always been extremely difficult relating to people having to choose between living on the street or staying in an abusive situation. Now there's even, you know, increased danger that they're going to have to go out onto the street. And of course, you know, if people are in that position, not getting support from the government, because of course we know that the homeless population in America is treated as something that deserves charity and, and crumbs and never justice. So, I mean, first of all, I think that the left needs to do an even better job of connecting tennis rights and the rights of homeless people. That's right. But That's what right. all this means is that when women who are facing domestic abuse enter the shelter system, for example, or are forced to live unsheltered on the street, you know, they have an extra danger added to their situation of having to, you know, make sure that they can stay out of the, you know, out of the, their, their location is, is private and, and they're protected. And that's not very easy in the mass shelter systems that, that people are forced into. In mass shelter systems right now that are over, over packed, um, COVID rates are, 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 are growing, of course, and they have been throughout, uh, throughout this pandemic, but also they've always been um, unsafe for, for women and children uh, just in general. So, you know, women and children are being forced onto the streets. It's, 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 I can't, I mean, I don't think we have a sense. I mean, we, we talk about uh, Joe Biden being an FDR and a couple of shows back, we said, well, is he gonna be an FDR or a Hoover? And uh, Hoover is exactly who we should be looking at when we're uh, looking at this growing housing crisis that is, we're, we're currently in it, we're just not seeing it yet. And as soon as we see it, just like we saw those, uh, those cars waiting for food um, across this country. But, you know, we saw the videos, I think it was in Dallas or Houston of the yeah. long lines of cars waiting for food. You're going to be seeing that with, with folks who can't find a place to live. Yeah, exactly. And I also think that America has done so much work, like the charity, the, you know, the charity industrial complex here with, with nonprofits in the U.S. has done so much work to really rationalize the fact that some yeah. people need to be homeless. So I think even if people do see people living on the streets, that's been so normalized in our culture. It's just taught that you're not, you know, you don't deserve housing as a human right, when of course you and I would say that's absolutely ridiculous and cruel and the richest country on earth that that's the case. But I think even more political education needs to be done by leftists to say, we're used to seeing homelessness in all of the major cities and not enough people are standing up and saying, this is not okay. Right, and being homeless too. I mean, if there's such a stigma attached to it, whether it's exactly. you've been evicted or, or have been uh, living, I mean, I, can't, I have several friends who've been evicted and have been forced to live um, on people's couches or move back home or whatever it is. There's stigma attached to that every sense of the way. Um, and we have to be you know, more open about having these conversations. You're right, Piper. Piper Winkler, such a star. <laughs> Our Thank associate so producer over me. here. Show wouldn't happen without Piper and Ruthie and Dorsey, of course, who's like helping out on the back end right now. As I'm like, clip now, turn it off, go quick. <laughs> a little bit of a crazy show today. Um, always a pleasure having you on. And to everybody, uh, we're going to wrap up uh, the show today, this Friday. We hope you have a really safe and healthy weekend. Um, next week, we're going to be back at it, talking about this administration, figuring out if there's any opening, if there's any hope. It's not looking like it right now, which means it's ex is exactly what Piper said. We have, we as leftists have to get much sharper with our messaging and much more open about the crisis that we're facing because, you know, when these eviction moratoriums do end, 
uh, Biden's going to be faced going into the inauguration with a massive homeless crisis in this country. And that is not a legacy that you want to inherit right away, as well as everything else. Uh, special shout outs, who we have in here? Given some shout outs. Ooh, there's a lot happening here. Uh, shout out to Squirrel Lips. Thank you so much. And Jay and Stizef, I hope I said that right. Thank you for the love. And Murphy, uh, yes, thank you for the Nina Lakani interview. That was Piper. Uh, that was an incredible interview. I would love to have her back on. I, I am, you know, these are the stories that we need to discuss, um, especially when it comes to the tactics more and more because, uh, you know, we seem very safe here in our bubbles in the US, but um, have no sense that even in 2016, this type of targeting can happen. Um, Mountain West Socialist, thank you. Here's a super chat for, ha for you having to put up with all that on my birthday, no less. Happy birthday. If I had one of those Sam Cedar, you know, sounds, I, I, I don't have that. Maybe someday we'll get that. Happy birthday. Imagine a sound. Happy, happy birthday. Everybody in the chat, shout happy birthday to Mountain West Socialist. Thank you for the love. Uh, maker of things, do not stare at a smartphone during an interview. Did I do that or did somebody else do that? I'm so sorry if I did, did I do that. I usually during, do that during the breaks. Um, it might have been an alert about a guest not making it, but if I did that, I'm so sorry. Uh, thanks to Harvey K in the chat, shaking it up, probably debating folks. I love when he gets in there and he debates and big, big, big thank you for M. Toussaint for filling in for mini doctors today and working the al algorithms. And super thanks to our moderators, Bob and Chokin uh, for keeping the chat room troll free and prairie fire kowalski from nebraska sends us some love and says you'd think sheriffs would see the pr value in saying they won't allow evictions exactly in a pandemic in winter landlords would get bailed out oops, would get bailed out by their government friends literally everyone wins i couldn't agree more i could they have landlord protections uh the rhetoric is not working people understand how big this crisis is not to mention small businesses are also uh going i mean i've said this on the show many times the percent of how many small businesses and cities across America, um, I would love to look at rural communities too, but this is what just I've been reading, that haven't been able to pay rent. I mean, it's, 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 it's in the high 70s, low 80s right now in the last couple of months. This is horrifying. We have no idea what's about to happen. Uh, Vinny Holiday, thank you for the love. So I looked at the beginning of the questioning with Katie. Perhaps your question came off a bit accusatory. At the same time, she was clearly ready to fight. Either way, we love your show. Thank you, Vinny. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna go back and watch it. Um, I was not there to give her an accusation. I told her, you know, in, in advance of the interview, uh, because she didn't want to debate Josh Fox, that I would be asking questions to kind of get into the weeds. And I would love to do the same thing with Josh. I would have loved to have it between them, but yeah, the dog agrees with me. I don't know if you heard that in the background. The dog agrees with me. All right, everybody, have a safe and healthy weekend. Be well, be with your loved ones, take care of each other, wear your masks. Uh, and try not, you know, just, just, just try not to hang out inside with masks off. That's, I think, the lesson of all this right now. Um, we will see you on Tuesday. Take care.